have seven new interns. Um, I'm going to let you t let them tell you about this lovely project. Hello, my name is Nick Byrne. I'm Maddie Ronisbeck. I'm Allison Henry. I'm Nick Catlin. I'm Oscar Platt. I'm Megan McCullough. I'm Emily Lawson. And we are researching the biodiversity, abundance, and distribution of deep sea scavenging megafauna in the Izuma Sound. So, what exactly is the deep sea? The UN defines the deep sea as anything at or below 200 meters. Oceans make up 73% of the planet, but would anyone like to guess what percent of that is the deep sea? I heard 95. Uh, close, actually, very close, 98%. Out of that 98%, though, humans have only explored a mere 5%. What that means is that we literally know more about the moon at this point than we do about the deep sea. This chart here shows the differing depths of the deep sea, with the deepest being about 11 kilometers below sea level. To put that in perspective, the, high, the highest point on this planet is about nine kilometers above sea level. If you were to take Mount Everest, flip it upside down, and put it into the deep sea, it would not reach the deepest depths. Organisms that exist at such depths have been forced to adapt to a variety of conditions, including low light levels, extremely high pressures, and extremely low temperatures. Scientists know very little about the organisms that exist there as well as the environments that they exist in. So learning more about the deep sea is becoming incredibly important because as you can see in this graph which compares the year to the mean depth of fishing, in the past 50 years fisheries have actually moved out of the epipelagic zone which is depths between 0 and 200 meters and into these deeper waters in order to keep up with the high demand for seafood. These fisheries use destructive and non-selective methods like trawling which consists of dragging a bottom net across the ocean floor. And as you can see before, there's this beautiful coral, and after, the ocean floor has been completely destroyed. They also end up with a lot of bycatch, and upon release, there's a high mortality rate among these deep sea species because they are not used to the temperature, pressure, and light levels of the shallower waters. There are other anthropogenic threats, for example, oil drilling and climate change. Oil drilling is very loud and invasive and disrupts the ecosystems. While climate change may deepen the thermocline, which can result in an overall decline in the f function of the deep sea ecosystems. So we're still learning how all of these threats impact the deep sea, but the hope is that in gathering this baseline information, we can protect these species. The main purpose of our study is to assess how depth affects biodiversity, distribution, and abundance of deep sea scavenging megafauna. As you can see here, this is a map of the Greater Bahamas, and the Exuma Sound is where we're doing our study. It is located off the southern tip of Eleuthera. More specifically, the Exuma Sound is a saltwater basin located in Sancho Bahamas. It is an inlet of the Atlantic Ocean that reaches depths of up to 2,000 meters. So far, there have not been any deep sea fisheries fishing in the Exuma Sound, so we can use our study as a baseline set of data. Inside of this red box is where we have done our study. You can see its relation to the Island School and CEI. We have also, in past years, done studies on deep sea sharks as well as deep sea cameras. So far this semester, 22 samples have been done in the Exuma Sound. We have used the continental shelf as a proxy for depth. The continental shelf, otherwise known as the wall, starts off at 30 meters and then immediately drops off to 300 meters and gradually gets deeper the farther out from the wall you go. To accomplish our objective, we use a trapping rig method, which consists of a cement weight followed by a cylindrical trap followed by a larger rectangular trap. Above the traps is a temperature depth recorder. This provides our data once the rig is hauled to the surface. The line varies from 500 meters to 1,500 meters because it marked at the surface by a buoy. Each rig is left for a 24-hour soak. Each trap is baited using Bonita tuna, as seen here, and once the 24-hour soak is up, the rig is hauled to the surface using an electronic winch, as seen here. This video shows the rig being hauled to the surface. First, we see the temperature depth recorder followed by both the rectangular and the cylindrical traps. 
this is the temperature depth coder. Here's a rectangular trap. And in these traps, you can see there's a fairly average catch of what we receive on a single rig dropping. These are our traps. This is our rectangular trap. The mesh is larger, and therefore it is selective to catch larger organisms. The cylindrical trap has smaller mesh, and is selective to catch smaller organisms. The organisms we collect from, collect from the traps, for example, this deep sea isopod, are brought back to the lab for processing. Morphometric measurements are taken along with, we record their weight and a photo of each organism. Over the course of the semester, we caught 10 different species of deep sea scavenging megafauna, including Nephropetus caribia, also known as a lobster, Heterocarpus incipher, a shrimp, Bathynomus gigantis, Borolanus recarinata, and we also discovered two new species during the course of this research project. <laughs> Borolana no species and Bathynomus maxiorum. We also found Cynipha brancus affinis, a cutthroat eel, Homola species, and Lamoha species, both different red crabs. The species are over there, and those are all ones that we caught in the traps during the semester. The depth range are the depth that we caught these species at, the temperature range are the temperature we caught these species at, and the total abundance caught is the amount of organisms we caught within each species. The max are Borolana tricarinata and Borolana nose species because we caught the most of them, and Bathynomus gigantis and Bathynomus maxiorum come out at a close second. We were focusing on these four species because they're all deep sea isopods, and which are crustaceans. The abundance of organisms is the total number of organisms caught. On the y axis is the number of organisms caught, and the x axis is the depth. The max is 678 meters, and we caught 140 organisms there. The minimum is 779 meters because we caught no organisms. The diversity index is the amount of diversity within each species. The y-axis is the diversity index and the x-axis is the depth. As the bar graph goes up, the diversity within each species also goes up. We use the Shannon Weaver index to check the ratio of diversity within each depth. This graph shows us the percentage of the genus of the bathynomus caught. Our y-axis is the frequency or percentage out of the species, and our x-axis is the depth at which these species were caught at. We are comparing the Bathynomus gigantis, which is shown in blue, to the Bathynomus maxiorum in gray. 27% of the Bathynomus maxiorum were caught at depths of 706 meters, while 17% of the Bathynomus gigantis were caught at 1,050 meters. The trend in the Bathynomus gigantis shows us that as depth increases, their abundance increases as well, and they can be found at depths ranging between 706 meters to about 1,050 meters. The bathynomus, we can, what we can tell from the Bathynomus maxiorum is that they, they can be found at depths between 637 meters to about 764 meters. This last graph is very similar to the previous one, except we are comparing the genus of the Borolana caught. Our axes are the same, and we're comparing the Borolana tricarinata in the blue to the Borolana nose species in the gray. 22% of the Borolana nose species and 20% of the Borolana tricarinata were caught at 678, um, 678 meters, which tells us that both of the, the max abundance of both of these species can be caught at the same depth. What we can also determine from their trend is that as that they can be caught, they cannot be caught at depths exceeding 764 meters. So this graph we have here on the left is from previous research done by Angel in 1996, which compares depth with the number of species caught of crustaceans. So this shows that there was a decline in number of species as you went to deeper depths. This is a trend that did show up in our research, but only after the 700 meter mark. So we do need to conduct research at deeper levels to fully understand what's going on with this decline in biodiversity. Our research also showed that the bathynomus were found at different depths, which could show us that there's competition or that they have different environmental preferences, such as pressure and temperature. On the other hand, the Borolana were found at the same depths, which could mean that they're competing for the same resources 
or have very similar environmental preferences. So in summary, we found that there was lower biodiversity at deeper depths, that the bathynomis were at different depths, and that the borolana were at the same depths. It is worth noting that we did not collect sufficient enough data to say that these trends are significant, but we can use our research as baseline data on what a deep sea ecosystem is meant to look like and apply that to further management and protection of the deep sea. Our research also helps us to fill in some of the knowledge gaps that we were aiming to fill at the beginning of this research. In further studies, we would like to look at deeper depths and locations outside of just the Exuma Sound. Additionally, because all of our data was collected over one season, we would like to look at data from different seasons and see if there's any trends in seasonality. Also, our data collection method, trapping, was relatively selective, so in future studies, we'd like to look at different data collection methods, such as deep sea cameras, which are less selective for future studies. This is our literature cited. We would like to thank all of the CEI Shark Research interns, our research advisors, Mackie and Georgie, Sophie Fisher, Axel Walters, and Kate Kincaid for their support throughout the semester. Are there any questions? So the question was whether we found a difference in the amount of juvenile species at different depths. Uh, so we did see, I mean it's hard, to, it's hard to really judge that because there's such a knowledge gap about the deep sea. So when we're dropping we're just gaining this fundamental knowledge so that's something that can be acquired in further knowledge. Pat? How does oil affect the deep sea? The question is, how does oil affect the deep sea? So oil, like oil drilling, which we talked about, because the deep sea is so interconnected, everything kind of affects, and plus it can, since oil does float, it doesn't directly affect the deep sea species, but because there's so much interconnection between the two, there is kind of this trickle-down effect that we see between the shallower water species and the deep sea species. Yes? How did you know that you discovered new species? So the question was, how did we know that we discovered new species? So when we find a species that we can't identify, we send it to a lab in China, I believe, and there's an expert there who helps us to identify the species and see if it really is a new species. Yes? Um, the question was, were the traps on the bottom or were they suspended? The traps are always set to the bottom because we provide more rope than the depth that we drop the trap at. Yes? Can you repeat the end of that question? So what our research told us is, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, why did we find these huge isopods if deep sea species are so small? And the reason for that is not actually that there are no small species in the deep sea. It's more due to our data collection method, which is trapping. Um, so if you looked at the traps, you could see that there was about this big of an opening. So our traps were selective to catch larger species, and smaller species would fall out of the traps.
Okay, so what did everyone think of that? <laughs> we are, um, we're going to invite everybody, it's going to be tight up here, to come up so you can give a chance to give everybody a round of applause. All advisors and all students are going to come back up for you. Just come on in and fill it up, guys. Woo! Um, you will have, there were some great questions, and I know we probably didn't have time to get everybody's question, and you've probably thought of lots more. Keep coming in, guys. Just fill up the whole area. Come on in. And um, so please continue to ask the students questions, us questions, advisors questions. Really grab us whenever you see us. Uh, we love to talk. These guys will love to tell you all the more things. We're just going to keep filling in. Come on in, make another row, guys. And the advisors, please, everyone come up and give you a chance to get a pictures with everyone together. Keep coming in, guys. Everybody in.